Thank you, Eliana. Um, uh, and welcome to everyone on behalf of the Cameron Stanford House and Gardens. I'm Andy Carpentier. I'm pleased to present uh, this uh, uh, presentation to you this afternoon. Um, a couple of other things, uh, besides being on the Cameron Stanford House board, I was also on the Dunsmere House board for a number of years prior to Cameron Stanford. And before that, I was on the Landmarks Preservation Advisory Board for the city of Oakland for 11 years. So I have sort of a passion for architecture and history. And uh, that's why I've uh, been involved in all of these historic homes in the, in the city of Oakland. Um, so this presentation is going to take us to the gold country, which is uh, rich in history and uh, really the beginning of California as we know it today. Uh, of course, it all began in 1848 with the discovery of gold and subsequent gold rush of 1849 and the throngs of people who came from all over to cash in on California's natural resources. Um, so, so let's see, I'm going to go to the next slide. There we go. Uh, so I'm going to begin with an example of original gold rush era housing, a miner's shack. It's a vernacular form of architecture uh, made of local materials and unskilled design and craftsmanship. Simple, practical shelter. Stone foundation, plank, wood wall construction. The affordable housing of its day. 19th century version of a tough shed. These kind of look like those tough sheds that they're using to house homeless these days. Um, they were meant to be temporary as most of the miners had no intention of staying in California. They were gonna return home after they made it rich. Of course, my own personal uh, search for affordable housing occurred a bit later. So let's jump ahead to 2008. So this is a little background. Uh, the, the gold rush uh, and Highway 49, which is uh, numbered based on the, the gold rush of 49 uh, goes from Oakhurst down here at the bottom of the map and then you can follow this yellow line all the way up past Grass Valley and this is really the gold country right on the um, western slopes of the Sierras and uh, this was a very popular area of course uh, in 1849 and the subsequent years when lots and lots of people from all over the world came here to uh, seek their fortunes. Um, the city of Sonora is about two hours east, due east of uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And there are two other towns. There's Columbia, which is a, uh, another uh, gold rush town, which has become a state park. And there's another town nearby called Jamestown. And these three are kind of the southern uh, cities of the Motherlode uh, area. Uh, let's see, what else did I have here? Yeah, so the city of Sonora was incorporated in 1851. It's, uh, I think, one year older than Oakland, in fact. And uh, th this is where our story is going to take us. Uh, this is the uh, main street of the city of Sonora. It has about a population of about 4,000 people. And it is the county seat of Tuolumne County, which is where Yosemite National Park is. And there's a number of a national forest in the county. So only about a third of the county is actually um, has a population. The rest of it is, is kind of wilderness areas. Um, this is an old main street. There are many of these buildings along it are right up against each other and many of them are made of stone and brick uh, because the original town uh, burned down several times. And the next slide is, this is just sort of an overview of the town. The, the main street, Washington Street, is sort of down, going diagonally from lower left to sort of middle right. And you can see in the background uh, here is the county courthouse, which was built in 1898. And you can see there's a little church there, and there's a couple of other churches on this hillside. And this neighborhood was uh, sort of jokingly named Piety Hill because of all of the churches in town seem to be uh, congregated around that, uh, the side of this hill. Um, there's a couple of the uh, uh, landmarks in town. This is the Tuolumne County Courthouse, 1898. There was a previous uh, courthouse here made of wood. 
that they took down to enlarge uh, in 1898. And then there's the Red Church, which is sort of at the top of Washington Street. The, the, the street kind of splits around this uh, 1860 uh, Carpenter Gothic uh, Episcopal Church, which is uh, quite a landmark in, in town. And here's a couple of uh, views, one looking on Washington Street in the other direction uh, towards the City Hotel, which is this building, which is a very old uh, brick building in town. And then this is a view that's very similar taken in 1927. So you can kind of see there, was, there, there were trees then, and, but there were still these sort of covered sidewalks down the main street of town. So the reason that I ended up in looking in Sonora is uh, in 2008, my uh, financial situation was, was such that I was thinking of potentially buying some, some other property and uh, originally was looking in a lot of areas of the gold country, including uh, Nevada City, which was very popular and, and I enjoyed going up there, um, in, especially in the summertime to go to the rivers and so forth. Uh, but it was getting kind of expensive and trendy there, and I really couldn't afford to buy something there. So I was looking in other areas, including um, Sonora. So this is the, one of the houses that I looked at when I was in, in Sonora. Um, I, there were a number of other houses that I looked at, but this one uh, was sort of intriguing in a couple of ways. One is that it was supposedly built in 1949, and I kind of looked at it and thought, well, it's possible that it was built in 1949, but it sort of had, there was something about it that looked like it really might not be from 1949. Um, and so this this is one of the houses that I'll show you some of the um, interiors uh, when we looked at it, uh, give you sort of a sense of uh, what we have to work with here. Um, this is a picture of the front porch. Uh, you can kind of see that there are these steel windows that are in the building that probably date from maybe the 40s or so. Uh, so that part of it in 18, or 1949 might be accurate, but uh, parts of the rest of the house are, uh, I don't know, it didn't quite mesh with me. This is a floor plan of the house, uh, front porch, very large living room. It's uh, 24 feet by 13 feet. Uh, there's a bedroom off of the living room with a closet. Um, one of the strange things about this is that in order to get to the bathroom from this front bedroom, you actually have to walk through the living room, walk through the, you know, the kitchen to get to the bathroom, which was not ideal. Uh, there's kind of a lean-to on the back of the house that has a laundry, which I think was originally set up for a dining room. There was sort of this C-shaped kitchen and uh, a small bedroom, which is about 10 feet by 10 feet, pretty small, and then a larger bedroom off to the side, and you have had to walk through one bedroom to get to the other. One of the things you'll notice in plan is that there's the, a water heater um, behind the door in the sort of the master bedroom suite, if you will. Uh, it does have a little uh, toilet in the corner and a sink outside, and the bathroom layout is uh, a little bit on the funky side here. It was very tight uh, bathroom. Uh, so this was sort of uh, what we had to work with and I'll give you some photos of the interior uh, pretty much as we found it when we uh, took a tour at first. This is the fireplace. Again, this is sort of an interesting fireplace. It might be from 1949. Uh, redwood paneling on the wall, which had a really glossy finish on it, which was pretty unappealing actually. And then for some reason in the living room, one wall didn't have any paneling at all. It just had this sort of torn wallpaper and you can see where there were some pictures on the wall, some ghosting there. And this is one of two heaters for the house. This is just a 1500 watt electric wall heater. There was one in the living room and one in the master uh, bedroom. Otherwise the house was uh, pretty much without any kind of heating or air conditioning. Uh, this is the kitchen, which is uh, you know kind of a garish uh, turquoise color. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting is in this part, which was kind of supposed to be the dining room, but I think had been used for a laundry uh, for all intents and purposes. Uh, had some ceiling tiles that had fallen down and there was uh, a, a beadboard ceiling um, underneath that, which was kind of interesting. Also, you'll notice uh, jealousy windows, which are not really ideal for a house that gets down into, a uh, house in an area that gets down into the 20s during the winter. 
Um, then you can see here, there's an interesting O'Keefe and Merritt uh, stove, probably like from the 70s. This is avocado green. I remember it uh, from when I was a kid. Anyway, interesting, you know, kind of funky looking uh, kitchen. Uh, some of the other rooms, this was the bathroom. Uh, you can see that's quite interesting here is there's a window with a jealousy window that actually uh, opens to the bedroom, to the master bedroom. And this little uh, uh, line here is one of the water lines from the water heater <laughs> that you can see through the window. So certainly a little bit different from what uh, one would be used to in looking at a house. Uh, this is the small bedroom. This was an interesting one too. It has a sheetrock underneath and then they put this uh, sort of knotty uh, pine uh, on the walls that you can sort of see through the knots to the sheetrock, which is an interesting aesthetic. And this is the master bedroom. You can see this wall also has some uh, paneling on it which, with a very glossy finish which shows all the imperfections in the, in the material and so forth, not very appealing. And it was very dark and the interiors were very dark. And then right behind this door, you can just see, begin to see a little bit of the uh, water heater. And this was one of the intriguing things. Uh, in the mass, in this front bedroom, there was a, a large closet and you could open up the hatch to go up into the attic. And I was curious to see what the attic looked like, but this was the, uh, site when you actually opened up the initial hatch. There was a, a secondary hole in a beadboard ceiling and then I stuck my camera up in there and just to see what was what was happening and you can see this uh, lovely um, uh, wallpaper which is obviously not from 1949. It's probably quite a bit earlier and this beadboard ceiling looks like it's quite a bit earlier as well. So that was sort of an intriguing thing and also a nice big attic space. Uh, lots of uh, structural members crisscrossing the space, so it made it pretty unusable, but it was a nice big space. So I, I kind of looked at the house and was interested in it, but uh, it's, oops, hold on a second. I was looking at other houses and kind of wrote it off as kind of a dump. And, but on the other hand, I, I start, it was in a nice neighborhood. This is in, on Piety Hill, by the way. It's in a, one of the nicer areas of uh, Sonora. And I took a look at the plan and just played around with it and realized that actually the bathroom was sort of the big problem with this uh, floor plan. So I, I thought, well, if I turn the bathroom 90 degrees and you sort of had a walk-through bathroom, then you could have direct access from the bedroom, which would be nice. You could redo the kitchen redo the master bathroom or bedroom and you know create some better spaces in the back where we've got a you know we can do a bathroom and a walk-in closet or something like that it had some potential so it was you know considering buying it just based on the potential that it had although it certainly uh would be a lot of work so then the question became when you know why buy this house <laughs> as an investment it's kind of an investment kind of not um well one is the location on piety hill it was it's a really nice big lot it's right downtown it's about two blocks from the county courthouse it's about two blocks from the red church uh, so it's right uh, amongst all of the landmarks and it's a block from the from washington street where there's a lot of activity and there's a park nearby and so forth so it's a really nice location uh, the cost was an interesting one. Um, I asked the realtor, I said, so if we, you know, take out the value of the land and what's left, how much are, how much is the house actually worth? And it turned out that if you took out the value of the land, the house was worth $35,000. So we paid basically for the structure, uh, $35,000 for this house, which is a pretty good, good deal. I thought it, even in 2008, when the market was getting kind of questionable. Um, so yeah, that was that was uh, certainly part of it. I think we were looking at other properties and found that this was the least expensive one. The only thing le less expensive than this was a, was a uh, mobile home. So this was probably one of the least expensive homes you could actually buy in the Gold Rush area at that time. Uh, a third reason to buy this house is it was challenging. It was kind of interesting to, to understand, you know, that there were these dropped ceilings and some work had been done over the years and it was, some of it could be reversed potentially and lead to some discoveries, which would be kind of fun. 
And the fourth reason, and the, probably one of the biggest reasons to buy it was I didn't need to live here. Uh, this is sort of a secondary home uh, and work could be done and one would not have to feel like they needed to live here. It could be just sort of a project until uh, such time as it was a little bit more livable. So for the first few years, I just basically paid, you know, made mortgage payments and didn't really do an awful lot and did some research because I wanted to find out, you know, what, how the house worked, you know, what had actually happened here and so forth. Um, fortunately, the courthouse is only two blocks away and there's a very nice uh, archive that the city has that allowed me to do some research very quickly and found out that this house probably dates from about 1866. There was a house on this property according to the tax records in the 1850s and it burned down in 1861. In August of 1861, there was a large uh, urban fire, very typical of a lot of the um, gold rush towns. And this house was apparently part of a conflagration that happened in August of 1861 that took the house uh, down. Uh, so the house sat empty, or the property sat empty for a while. It was just listed as a, uh, a plot with no improvements. And then in 1863, I think there were some improvements, but it didn't say that there was a house. And in 1867, um, the property sold and it definitely had a house on it. So probably between 1863 and 1866, uh, a house was built. And it appears from doing some forensics in the attic and so forth that it originally was just two rooms and a front porch. So it would have been a house of about 300 square feet, uh, you know, pretty small. Uh, we did find out that it does have single wall construction, very similar to the picture that you um, saw at the beginning of the, of the presentation of the little miner's shack. Um, single wall construction is basically just planks. So you you take a one inch thick board and you'd stand it up and you'd nail it together uh, with some other planks and create some walls. That way there's no insulation, no, you know, not really that much between you and the, uh, the outside. Uh, did find out that in 1872 and eight to, to 1874, some major additions were done and the taxes uh, changed accordingly in the, in the, value of the property went up because of it. Uh, so this is probably what the house looked like in 1874. There were probably a total of six rooms. There were front bedroom, front parlor, I'm assuming. There was a back parlor, another bedroom, and some kind of uh, space in the back for probably a kitchen or some kind of storage spaces. And then probably before 1885, this uh, extra bedroom was added. And at one time, the Sanborn fire map showed that there was a wraparound porch on three sides of it, but that uh, disappeared over time. And then about 1960, this master bedroom uh, was built. So that was kind of interesting just to find out how the, how the house evolved sort of in a, in a circular pattern in some ways around the a central bathroom, which was kind of interesting. And of course, this wasn't originally a bathroom. Uh, we found out that I think the, uh, bath, the indoor plumbing was added in 1953, so that was pretty late. <clears throat> this is a picture that I found of uh, Washington Street uh, in 1866, looking north. The red church is here. Uh, the courthouse, you can't see, it's off to the side here, and it was a wooden courthouse at the time. But this red arrow points to uh, a little tiny house on the hill, which is probably what the precursor of this house uh, was in 1866. This is a floor plan that I developed uh, that shows basically how I restored the house and, and made it into something that was a little bit more usable. Uh, the bathroom was turned and you can walk through it now. Uh, kitchen uh, was opened up. I put a water, the water heater in the corner and took it out of the bedroom. Uh, nice long 22 foot long counter with lots of appliances and so forth to make it usable. But it's a very long slender kitchen, but it, but it works pretty well. And then the master bedroom did, did a little bit of work there, added a, a fireplace uh, that created a, uh, walk-in closet for the front bedroom, uh, master bathroom closet, 
Um, and then added a sleeping porch. So this is the only addition that I did to the house was to add a sleeping porch and some French doors that allowed uh, you to open these up uh, during nice weather, which happens quite a lot. And uh, be, feel like you're sleeping outside, which was kind of fun. So here's some photographs during uh, construction of the house. Um, this is the kitchen floor originally. One of the things that was very intriguing is not only is the soil not very far down, because uh, this is on the uphill side, but also we found these sort of notched uh, four by fours. And then they were every other one was a notched four by four. And then there were four by fours that were um, in between them. And the contractor was a bit, a bit perplexed about this, but I think I figured out the answer. And that was these four by fours that are continuous were the original floorboards that were holding up the floor. And these notched ones were added later. And somebody must have crawled underneath the house and installed these because the floor was probably getting a little bit bouncy because the main structural members were too far apart. And that seems to be pretty consistent under the house in general. And, and, and all of the rooms had to have some augmented uh, structural framing. This is the new floor going in. This is the floor was actually in fairly bad shape when we took out uh, the linoleum and a couple of other layers of, of old flooring. Um, there was a lot of dry rot and damage and so forth and patchwork. So we, we were able to purchase this uh, wood from a um, warehouse in San Mateo that was being taken down. It was built in 1906. And they had a lot of this uh, wood from, this, from the roof that was uh, for sale. And so we bought that and used that for the flooring because it was very similar to the original flooring that was, was in, in the house. So this is a before and after picture. This is the, the turquoise kitchen with the uh, avocado green stove and the jealousy windows. Uh, this is what, what we ended up doing. This is one of the first rooms that we, we restored. Um, you can see that it has the original beadboard ceiling. I wanted to expose as much of the original um, character defining elements as possible. Uh, another thing that well, I'll show you in a moment is there's this little vignette in the sheetrock over here, uh, which is a piece of wallpaper that we just discovered in the kitchen, uh, probably dating from the 30s or 40s and wanted to uh, be able to highlight uh, sort of the history of this room by having a little cutout uh, with a piece of glass there, which allows you to see that. I thought if we get, if we get tired of looking at this little uh, vignette in the wall, we could always just get a, a picture and hang it over it. <laughs> uh, you'll notice there are, are uh, transom windows and new doors. All the doors were, were, were pretty in, in pretty bad shape and inconsistent through the house. Uh, I added um, transom windows uh, so that the house could, uh, the house has fairly high ceilings. Most of the ceilings of the older parts of the house are nine feet, uh, three inches. So we could, had the ability to do transoms and also that would help uh, ventilate the top of the rooms and the, and the whole house actually. And that system uh, works pretty well. Uh, here's some of the wallpaper vignettes. This is this is actually the, the little cutout that I have in the wall. And this shows the wallpaper. And this is some wallpaper from the living room. These are, there were wallpaper from many different time periods in the house, all the way back to the uh, 1860s, we believe. Um, just layers and layers of it that we found underneath the, uh, the wood paneling. So we've saved a lot of this and 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 have it in picture frames around the house and and also these little vignettes in the wall like this. So another view of the kitchen. This is the kitchen, uh, the turquoise kitchen, and they had built this kind of funky uh, refrigerator alcove right in the middle of the room, and it didn't even doesn't go up to the ceiling, but it certainly you know created a I guess a separation maybe between the dining area and the and the kitchen, but it certainly helped a lot to take that out and open open up the room. You can see instead of having a solid door at the at the back end where the patio is, we put in a pair of French doors, lets a lot more light in. Again, you can see the, the beadboard ceiling. There was a wall here at one time where this, this uh, little piece of trim is. Uh, again, it must have been a long time ago because it was the, the window falls right where the, where the wall would have been at some point in the past. Um, the jealousy windows were removed and we added some double hung uh, wood windows and we, we kept all of the all of the wood 
windows and doors uh, a clear finish so that those kind of created that nice uh, woodsy uh, look. And here's our um, kitchen cabinets that go you know, for 22 feet. We, did, we ended up keeping the uh, O'Keefe and Merritt uh, avocado green stove. It sort of went with the color that we chose for the uh, um, kitchen. So that's probably one of the few uh, pieces that, uh, of the old house that we kept. And all of these light fixtures are, were bought on eBay and rewired and put in the house. I, I wanted something to uh, suggest the, the age of the house. It's a hundred and, you know, 150 plus year old house. It really should at least look like it has some, some history to it instead of uh, what had happened previously in the 1950s when they uh, remodeled. Uh, the bathroom, this is the original bathroom that we, we found. You can sort of see that there's not a lot of uh, knee space if you're using the commode. Uh, this, this probably was not even the sink that was there in 1950. They probably added this and needed some more storage space. And so it got a little bit tight. Um, interestingly enough, this floor here um, was probably done in the, I don't know, maybe 2000. Underneath that was a pebble. Uh, linoleum floor that was probably from the 70s and under that was a red marbled floor uh, probably from the 1953 um, renovation so a lot of, lot of layers of history underneath this uh, this floor and this is the uh, bathroom that we created um, I found a high tank toilet which I thought was kind of cool the, the most expensive part of it was actually the pipe that connects the two pieces. I think it was like two hundred and seventy dollars or something for this brass pipe, but the rest of it I got on eBay for you know not not an awful lot of money. Uh, we put in a nice, very historic-looking um, hexagon white uh, porcelain tile floor with the marble uh, surround at the at the base. Uh, a nice tall um, shower with a glass door and a glass window that goes up to a skylight. There's two different shower heads in there that are historic. There's a big um, uh, chrome, plated, chrome plated brass uh, Speakman uh, shower head, which is great because it just gushes water. And there's another one that's a Victorian uh, rain head that's way up on the ceiling that you can turn on. Uh, independently and that gives you that sort of rain effect that was popular in the Victorian times and since we had such a tall ceiling it really made sense to try to do that. Uh, because this room doesn't really get any natural light from windows we did put in a skylight and uh, ran the beadboard all the way up to the skylight and then created this um, sort of sense of that you could put some lay-in lights here if you wanted to but it, it uh, allows the ceiling to continue across the room and then this this feels like it's uh, something above the ceiling as opposed to just everything just running up. This is the original beadboard ceiling here for the house and what we decided to do for the bathroom and every other room in the house was just use beadboard as the wall material. It seemed like it uh, went well with the ceiling and it uh, gave that sense of, of history without uh, uh, being something something new or old, particularly this, it's interesting that they still make the exact same beadboard that they made probably 130 years ago. Uh, this is the living room. Uh, there was a wall in the middle of the living room that separated the front and the back parlors at one time, and you can kind of see the outline of it here and here, and you can see there's different wallpaper uh, finishes on either side of that wall. This is all the dropped ceiling here. Uh, you can see it in this picture as well. This is uh, the living room after we refinished the floor. This is the original floor. And you can sort of see there's a line across the room where the, where the plank wall came up and would have, would have extended across here. Uh, th remember this uh, from a previous picture was a wallpaper and it had tears on it and the ghosts of the pictures. We actually found some um, uh, contact paper, <laughs> which looked similar to the walls on the side that we, we put in here temporarily while we were uh, paying off the mortgage and kind of uh, trying to live in the house as it was. But here's the drop ceiling. This is after the she sheetrock had been removed. And then the next pictures will show uh, what the beadboard up above that was hiding. And then what happens when we took out that framing and opened it up to the nine foot three ceiling height. Uh, and removed all of that uh, drop ceiling. Here you can see the, 
the metal windows that had been installed. This, this must have been done in 1953 when all of these uh, studs were added. These studs were not the original wall finish. The original wall finish is behind here. Uh, it's just uh, wood planks. And in 1953, they also put on a horizontal um, redwood siding, which is in really good condition. And uh, we kept that as well. Uh, yeah. Also, you can see just a little bit over in this far right corner, there was a fireplace. There's an outline of a fireplace that was in this parlor at one time uh, many years ago. Uh, here we go uh, with the beadboard, new finish. Uh, one, it, one of the interesting things was is that the beadboard ceiling in the front parlor was uh, lower by an inch and a half than the back parlor. So there's actually a, a, a one and a half inch difference in ceiling height between these two areas. This is where this, this uh, sort of false beam that we put in here is just a four by four. Uh, makes up the difference, uh, the transition between the two ceilings, and is also where the old uh, wall was before it sort of, uh, there, there's a gap in the uh, uh, beadboard ceilings that needed to be covered up. So that served that purpose as well as to create a transition for the offset. And then what we did is we put in a secondary beam as well that sort of uh, is symmetrical about the fireplace so that it looks a little bit more, uh, designed as opposed to haphazard have just having one beam going across the room sort of in the middle. So that's kind of what we did there. And here you can see the trim going on. Uh, we use some sort of Victorian trim and you can see also the, the windows have been replaced with uh, a pair of double, double hung windows that are in wood. Again, it gives a little bit better sense of proportion for uh, an older house. And you can see the transom windows here. These, all these rooms have transoms. And this is the final uh, living room when it was finished. We found a, uh, a deer head at a local flea market and it was kind of an interesting story. The, uh, we were thinking about ha getting this uh, deer head before we even put the, before we even uh, built this room out and had a, we still had a lowered ceiling. So it didn't fit at the time, but we thought, well, you know, if we could buy it now, we could do it, install it later. And the owner said it was $60. And I thought, well, that's actually not a bad price. <clears throat> and his wife was sitting in the background reading a book and she, looked up over her glasses at us and said, that's negotiable, really slowly like that. So we knew that we probably could uh, do better. So we walked around and uh, came back. And by the time we were ready to leave, it was $30. So we ended up getting a nice uh, <laughs> fireplace uh, uh, piece for uh, $30 to go with the rest of the house and gives it that kind of cabiny look. Uh, this is a view from the other side of the living room. You can see how, how much nicer these uh, double hung windows look than the original or the, the, the ones from the 1950s that were steel. And again, there's a transom over the uh, door so that you can open this up in the summertime and let all the hot air uh, you know, flow through the rooms and out. Uh, this was an, one of the things that I find really fascinating about a beadboard is that you can easily do hidden cabinets. Uh, what I wanted to do in the living room was to showcase this uh, sort of pink floral wallpaper that was originally in the living room, but I didn't really want to have to look at it, so <laughs> I created a cabinet. So you can see here on the on the left hand side, this is the cabinet when it's closed. You just push on it and it, it pops open like this, and then you can open it up and see the uh, wallpaper uh, and I stare, store uh, plans and so forth inside this cabinet. Um, the house does have a number of other similar cabinets for various purposes where we've got uh, uh, extra space for storing things. Uh, this is the front bedroom. This was the before, there just had a little aluminum window on this side, we had a steel window on this side and again dark uh, very glossy paneling and a uh, acoustical tile ceiling. All of this must have been done in the uh, 1953 renovation. Um, again, we, we raised the ceiling, uh, put in a nice uh, wood window, and then here's one of the French doors that's gonna go out to the sleeping porch. 
here's the bed in that bedroom. You can kind of look out the door to the living room here. And this is a wallpaper vignette that occurs behind the bedroom door. Uh, there was a really nice uh, wallpaper, has some flowers on it and some vertical lines of gold in the, in the wallpaper, which is kind of nice as a uh, vignette again. And this is again looking through the bathroom to the to the kitchen. This is the kind of the walkthrough bathroom. And here's the sleeping porch. Uh, again, found some interesting uh, light fixtures uh, on eBay that we purchased to uh, put on the porch. Actually, the the fitting for this one that's up at the top came uh, was something that we found in the house and wanted to keep with the house, so we put it out on the porch because this is probably not uh, UL rated. <laughs> And you can see here, um, we wanted to keep the railing height for the, the new screen porch at the same height as the railing for the um, front porch, which is too low to meet code. So what we ended up doing is putting a wood rail here and then putting in um, a steel cable up to the height that we needed for a new um, porch th that meets code. But from the outside, you really don't see this these wires at all. You just see the the uh, rail that's down down at the right height. And this is all screened in so that uh, you can open these doors and don't have to worry about any bugs getting in. A couple more views of the porch. This is from the master bedroom looking out. This is from the front bedroom looking out. And this is the master bedroom. You can see again, even, even glossy, uh, wood paneled ceiling on this room. It was very dark. And this is sort of under construction. This is the door that goes out, to, out the back from the master bedroom. And this is the fireplace that I created. And it's got a, a space up above, which again, which is sort of a, a hidden compartment that you can't really tell is there. Um, but there's a space in there for a TV and so forth. Um, the fireplace is not real. I did a soapstone. Uh, floor still thought it would be interesting to have a, a nice piece of stone there and then this is just thin brick but it's done in a, a style that makes it look like it's you know pretty authentic and then this is just using some trim and various things to create a, a simple mantle um, there was some room for a bookcase and a, and a bench in the back the master bedroom and this is the bookcase and you can see the master bedroom. These are the doors out to the sleeping porch. And I've got some little windows that face north. It's a bit cold in the wintertime uh, in this direct direction. So I wanted to minimize this, but I thought it would be nice to you know, create some more light for the, for the bedroom. And again, everything's finished in beadboard. This, this ceiling was brand new uh, the, the, because this room was built in the 1960s. They just had a, a plot that uh, uh, dark paneling, panel ceiling and they didn't have anything up above it. Uh, the master bathroom, this was the original master bathroom. It was a little, little closet with a commode in it. And this is the new walk-in master uh, bath. This is a, uh, um, what I'm calling this is a floating uh, linen cabinet. Uh, we wanted to not have it go all the way down to the floor and ceiling because it would have been like nine feet tall and it seemed like it was too tall and too heavy for the room. And I like the idea of keeping the floor um, clean and simple and letting something happen underneath here. So uh, it just sort of hangs on the wall, even though it's a fairly large piece. And this is the bathroom looking in the other direction. Nice reading light. <laughs> Clawfoot tub. Interestingly enough about the clawfoot tub, I bought this at uh, Omega Salvage in uh, Berkeley and had it uh, hauled up, uh, had it cleaned up and painted and hauled up to Sonora. And about uh, three weeks after we received it, uh, one of our neighbors was hauling out a clawfoot tub uh, that they were getting rid of, of course. <laughs> And that's the completed house. You can see the sleeping porch there on the on the right hand side. And we just uh, basically kept the lower portion of it the same color that the house was originally. Did a lighter color for color green for the upper part, and then uh, sort of a, a warm white for the uh, the trim. 
So going from there, I just wanted to point out a couple of things as, as I've lived and in, in, in vacationed in Sonora for the last uh, 12 years. A couple of things of, of note, uh, the little shack that's on the side of the hill that was our house uh, in 1866, uh, you, you'd think that there wouldn't be any of these things left, but uh, in fact, um, not you know probably a couple of miles from our house, in a in a kind of a ranch area, uh, I found this, which is probably very similar to what the house looked like uh, when it was built in 1866. Uh, it's got board and batten siding, which is what our house definitely had, and it had a uh, a porch and a fairly steep roof. Um, I'm not sure why they decided that they needed a very steep roof, but a lot of the homes uh, in that, from that era had this uh, very steep pitch, pitched roof. Here it is from the other side. It's got, you know, windows are very small. Windows were very expensive at the time, so they probably didn't have very many uh, windows. Uh, this, you can see it in the back. This is the same, same place and there's another one in front which is a little bigger so that I don't know what what the story is here maybe they started out here and then they decided that was too small and they built another one in front of it but all of these are just outbuildings at the moment for for somebody but they're all fairly uh, old homes some other uh, historic homes in the area that uh, really kind of show the same uh, age I think uh, this one here you can see is very interesting that there's a vertical piece here and then a, and then more horizontal siding. So this is obviously added on to the, the back may very well have been added on to as well. And it has a sort of wraparound porch, which seems to have been uh, very popular back in the 1860s and 70s. Another house with a wraparound porch, very similar kind of peaked, uh, you know, uh, relatively high pitched roof for the area. Another one in Sonora probably also was a miner's cottage at one time. It was expanded and, and used. It's got a porch on two sides. This one I thought was interesting. This is uh, in Sheep Ranch, which is a really small uh, mountain community in not, not too far from uh, Murphy's in uh, the gold country. This was the uh, post office at one time. Uh, there's a little window here that you would you do your transactions and then uh, you know just a door to get in but it, it, again it's very similar in style to that uh, 1860s uh, kind of miner shack this was an interesting uh, thing this is on the way to um, angels camp on highway 49 this is an old uh, kind of shack that uh, is even small you know probably about the size maybe of uh, our house originally it's got a little lean-to on the back it's got huge windows for the size of this uh, this small uh, structure and it's just been abandoned and sort of sitting off to the to the side by itself but about a mile down the road there's this building which is brand new it was built I think in 2018 and it looks very similar in some ways and it's also very tiny I'm kind of curious about this uh, you know what the, th the thought was here uh, but it's a very small house, not not much bigger than this one. And that's uh, the end of my presentation. So if uh, anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Thank well, you for your attention. <laughs> well, thank you, Andy, that was awesome. Um, there were definitely comments in the chat about what a great job you did, and I agree, it looks beautiful. Um, so I did write down a couple questions from uh, the Q&A and the chat. Rhonda was curious about um, going back to the photo that you shared of the turquoise kitchen. She wanted to know how high the ceilings were in that room. Hmm. That room, uh, the ceilings on uh, the upper side of the roof are probably about eight foot six and probably about seven feet at the lower lower end. Yeah, so they get they do get it does get a little bit low in that room towards the uh, the windows, and so that's why we ended up putting the counter on that side because uh, of that. And we didn't put any upper cabinets in because the room is already relatively shallow; it's only about nine foot three um, deep. So we wanted to not have any uh, cabinets on the wall. We wanted to put everything in lower cabinets, right. keep it as op open as possible, and lots of light. All right, and uh, Charmaine wanted to know if you knew if the house ever had an outhouse. Uh, I'm sure it did. I haven't 
found it yet, but um, uh, there was on one of the Sanborn maps, some small structure in the back, which I'm assuming may have been an outhouse. There was also a, uh, a fruit cellar of some sort. There was a masonry structure that was attached to the backside of the house that was up into the hillside, which I'm sure must have been used for storing, um, you know, roots and vegetables and things like that when they didn't have any refrigeration. By the way, I do have a, uh, uh, a metal detector, which is really fun to use there because it goes off all the time everywhere because there are so many old rusty nails in the ground and pieces of metal just because it's been occupied for 150 years. There's stuff in the ground everywhere. <laughs> but most, of it, most of it's junk, unfortunately. We haven't found, found too much yet. No. <laughs> that was actually one of my questions was if you yeah. found anything <laughs> anything cool while you were doing this remodel. I, the, the, I haven't found anything in the yard really but the interesting thing was there was uh, I, I go hiking in in the area a lot and there's a community college nearby and went hiking on their trail around the campus and happened to notice there was there's like a quarter on the ground in the middle of the trail it wasn't really well hidden it looked like somebody had just dropped it in the on the trail and it was kind of dusty and so forth. And I reached down to, to pick it up and I thought, oh, it's not a quarter. And then I looked at it a little bit more closely and it had a date on it, 1853. I found an 1853 quarter just sitting on a trail, uh, which, which I, th I still can't believe, uh, uh, you know, how did that get there? But it must have been lost during the gold rush, you know? Yeah. It's your lucky quarter now, hopefully you yeah, still have that it. Is, <laughs> that, that is my lucky quarter. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and going back to the outhouse question, um, kind of related, Rejoice wanted to know if he could talk a little bit about um, the sewer system of the house, um, maybe as it was <laughs> how it is now and what you had to do with that. This is, yeah, this is a great segue. I forgot to mention, um, when we were looking at the house, one of the things that was interesting is, uh, you know, I kept going back and looking at, at how things worked. One of the things that happened was the, the master bedroom, for example, didn't have any electricity when we looked at the house. And there were uh, long extension cords running from the kitchen into the master bedroom to, you know, the light lights and so forth, because they didn't have any power in there. And it turned out that it was just the circuit breaker that had, had gone bad, and they needed to replace it. It was like a $30 fix. But one of the other things that was uh, certainly an issue and a much bigger issue was the um, sewer system. There, there was a, a city sewer line and the sewer went into the, it was, was functional, but um, not terribly functional. Uh, in doing some of my research uh, before buying the house, uh, we flushed the toilets and I noticed that there was sort of a strange noise outside when I flushed the um, uh, toilet in the master uh, bedroom, master bathroom, and uh, had somebody go out and and see where the noise was coming from and flushed it a couple more times. And uh, to my surprise, there was a geyser in the front yard. Um, as the toilet was flushed, the um, sewage would uh, be ejected from the pipe in the, uh, in the front yard, <laughs> the sewer clean out. And it turned out that the sewer was backed up and also broken. And so that, uh, you know, kind of reduced the value of the property. And so some, some money was taken off for that, uh, the fact that the sewer had to be replaced. But that was all done as part of the uh, refurbishment of the house. So it has, a, it has a brand new sewer system. It has a brand new uh, complete water system was, was, was upgraded all the way to the street. Uh, is, it, it all needed to be redone. That's an um, interesting challenge, I guess, that you had to deal with. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, it reminded me a little bit at, at times of, of uh, I don't know if, if people are old enough to remember Green Acres, but, uh, you know, when, when uh, the guy from the city bought a house in the country and it was, it was, it was pretty much trashed and, and, Every things like that happened all the time where n nothing was working as one would expect. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's just the way it goes with old houses, I think. <laughs> yeah. But um, another question um, that I actually had was, uh, did you use any kind of, uh, or any particular historic guides to select the colors of the paint that you chose or any of the other design details that you ended up with? Not really. Um, 
what I wanted to do is, is I wanted to try to bring the house back to a more historic look uh, and, and, and really um, celebrate the fact that it's a 150 year, year old house. And so that's, uh, that's why I um, chose to, to continue using the beadboard everywhere because it, uh, after we did the bathroom and the, and the bathroom came out looking so great and it had that, that the interest of the beadboard and so forth. And I thought, you know, we should just do the whole house and beadboard. It really looks great. So we did that. And then uh, the colors chosen, I wanted to keep it as light as possible, but also give it some color. Um, and so I think the color for the most of the house is called spooky, which I thought was an interesting uh, choice of colors. <laughs> not, not that I, you know, I, I chose the color before I realized what the name was, but uh, I thought it was kind of funny. And, uh, and then the trim is an off white kind of like a milk paint. Um, it's got a lot of, of warmth to it. And uh, again, it's sort of a historic looking color based on my um, knowledge of historic colors, but I didn't go out of my way to pick historic colors. In fact, the, the color on the outside of the house, I, I decided I wanted to keep the dark green base, but I wanted something a bit lighter for the um, upper portion of it. And I just picked uh, a lighter version of the same color. And I wanted to keep, the, keep it green, uh, partially because it does sort of look like a cabin and, and kind of lends itself to that color scheme, but also because it's, uh, the house is located on Green Street. And strangely enough, uh, mine is the only green house on Green Street. There's nobody, nobody else has a green house, which I think is kind of an interesting thing. So that's, that's part of the reason I kept it that color. Cool. Um, okay, so I think just a couple really short questions. Uh, Dan was sure. curious how long the reveal, or the, sorry, the remodel took. Oh, good, 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 good question. Um, because I wasn't living there, I did the did the remodel in three phases uh, in 2012, 2013, and 2014. The 2012 was the kitchen and the bathroom because those were the, the most important pieces to get done. And then 2013 was the living room and the front bedroom. And then 2014 was the master suite. And I'm currently working on uh, the attic. There is a staircase that we uh, added just recently from the kitchen up to the attic. And I plan on doing a, uh, another bedroom in the attic with two single beds and a, uh, uh, another bathroom. So it'll be three bathrooms, three bedrooms when it's completed for such a small house. It's, yeah. it's, it's actually a lot, it's actually a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be based on the, the, f the first photo that I saw. So that's, really yeah, it, it really looks kind of cute and small from the street, but it, it goes back a, a little bit further than one would think. Yeah. Um, well, that brings me to our last question. Um, someone was just wondering how uh, how many square feet total the cabin is. Square feet, I think it's 1,200 currently, yeah. And, and if we do the attic, it'll probably be about 14, okay. 1450, something like that, yeah. That's a good size. Yeah, it's not bad for, you know, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted something, I wanted a small project that I could actually, you know, uh, finish. Yeah. <laughs> as opposed to some some of the houses there was there, there is a, actually a house in uh, Sonora that we were looking at at the time that was a Victorian mansion of about I think it's about 6,000 square feet that was built by a, uh, a congressman at the, uh, in the 18 late 1880s if I'm not mistaken it's called the Curtin Mansion C-U-R-T-I-N and it was on the market for a hundred nine thousand dollars which was really tempting because it's you know huge house and it was really beautiful but uh it needed millions of dollars worth of work <laughs> and so that uh kept me from buying it but somebody did eventually buy it and turned it into a senior living facility for i think an, oh, quite a number of people live there now which is great great use for the property yeah that's great i'm gonna actually i wrote it down so i could look it up and see if there are any photos around so um but i think actually that's all we have time for in terms of questions